thank you very much to Icepel for inviting me to give this keynote and to being here with you um, this afternoon, today. And I would just like to um, start with a personal story about my interest in intercultural learning. And it's getting on for 30 years ago now, in the early 90s. I was working for an organization where I was responsible for introducing English to preschool aged children. And in one of my classes, I had a little girl of Chinese origin with adoptive Spanish parents. And at first, she was very lively, bright, and participative in lessons. And then I noticed her becoming much more subdued. And I didn't really understand it until one day, I noticed a group of children on another table laughing at her. And one of them was making a gesture to slit their eyes. I was completely appalled. This was pure bullying by four-year-olds, um, something I had never encountered before. And I don't think until that moment I'd ever thought of applying the term bullying to preschool children. And ever since then, I've felt a passion about the value of intercultural learning and making sure that nothing like that ever happens in any of our classes ever. And you know something, we all tend to think of intercultural learning as a global or 21st century skill, very right on and new. But as with many things, it's been around a long time. And in the same way, when you learn a word in a new language and it suddenly pops up everywhere, I found that in thinking about intercultural learning and this webinar, that's happened to me too. And Here's a plaque in my local park, and I must have walked past it a million times, but serendipitously, I only noticed it properly last week. I think we're probably a very multilingual group, but just in case anyone needs a translation, it says, man's homeland is the world. And if it were up to me, I would erase the word foreigner from all dictionaries. And Justo Arosemena is, I had to look him up afterwards, a lawyer and human rights activist in Panama, 1817 to 1896. And I think, well, as long as we add woman's homeland too, I think probably most of us could sign up to this sentiment. And the aim of my session with you today is to explore issues, challenges, and solutions in implementing intercultural competence effectively in early years and primary language teaching contexts. And this is what we're going to look at. I'm not going to read all that out, um, but um, I'm not going to read it all out, but the, the notes are highlighted in blue. Sorry, I just had a funny message appearing on my screen, so I hope you can hear me and see me all right. Okay, so let's um, start with the perspectives and briefly explore some of the terms used and the perspectives they imply. And the first one, teaching culture. Whoa, this is an umbrella term often used to refer to common history, social behavior, traditions, etc., shared by a group of people. But the notion of teaching culture reflects a rather out dated concept of homogeneous, static national cultures, often focused on an elite group. And this tends to lead to an emphasis on what is foreign and a simplistic kind of us and them approach based on national borders. And it doesn't capture the way that culture is a shifting dynamic concept, which is reflected in a multiple multitude of ways in any, in every individual and society. This is the term used for children to understand their own and other cultures and seen as a vehicle to combat prejudice and stereotyping and to promote tolerance and diversity, acceptance of diversity. And the word understanding 
recognizes that children are likely to have less interaction than older learners with people of other cultures outside the classroom. And in this way, it's a precursor to intercultural communicative competence. And this, of course, is the work of Byram, 1997, and most recently now his update in 2020. And he is, of course, the widely acknowledged guru of intercultural learning in an ELT context. And Byram's framework builds on communicative competence and is based on five savoir, comprising knowledge, skills, behaviors, attitudes, and awareness. However, we need to remember that Byram's model was not developed with children in mind, even though Byram and others have claimed that some aspects of the model, such as comparative knowledge and attitudes of openness and curiosity and so on, can apply to children. One of the benefits of Byram's model, model is that it is feasible to implement and kind of concrete, but it's also been very criticized along for not taking account of ambiguities, tensions, and contradictions in more varied and complex intercultural contexts in the 21st century, including, of course, digital communications. And the last perspective to just explore Intercultural citizenship builds on the concept of intercultural competence by extending this to involvement and action in the local community or wider global community outside home or school. And it is based on a view of language that takes into account multilingual identities and translanguaging and builds on the affordances of globalization and technology to allow intercultural communication and coordinated social action to take place. And topics with a high social relevance directly related to citizenship and global issues, such as poverty, hunger, climate change, form the content of lessons and develop a wide range of analytical and critical thinking skills, potentially leading to direct action in the local or wider global community. These perspectives are largely based on teaching older learners and adults. And when it comes to teaching children, research shows that there are some very particular issues and challenges that we need to address. According to research carried out by various people, if you're familiar with the literature, Driscoll, Simpson, Woodgate Jones, people like that, in theory, intercultural learning is seen as highly desirable by policymakers, school administrators, and teachers. Most people say how important it is for children to reflect on the lives of others and their own to prevent negative stereotypes, racism, and prejudice. And yet, at the same time, what happens in practice is haphazard, bitty, and neither strategically planned or systematically implemented. And I think this may resonate with many of us. We think it's a great idea, but how do we actually go about it in an age-appropriate way? And do we have the time for this along with everything else we have to do? And we need a model that closes this gap. In most DLT course books, the predominant emphasis is on the development of language skills. And as has been pointed out, this is historically the result of the influence of adult syllabuses, the common European framework, and young learner exams. When intercultural learning is specified, it tends to be with reference either to traditional songs and rhymes or cultural facts that children compare with their own. So actually what we need is a model that integrates language development and intercultural learning with both specified in a similar level of detail in the syllabus in terms of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and awareness. And this leads on to the next point, which is the way culture is represented, which tends 
to reflect the idea of a homogeneous national culture, the kind of foreign us and them, and to focus on superficial facts, those F topics originally mentioned by Claire Crouch, but others have added to, you know, the kind of thing, food, folklore, fashion, facts, festivals, famous people. And of course, this is misleading in the sense that any language encompasses and reflects multiple cultural realities. And it's also just as likely to reinforce prejudices and stereotypes as it is to promote understanding, tolerance and respect. At the same time, and actually Byram and Wagner have pointed this out, the concept of culture as referring to a national group is understandably part of teachers' understanding of what culture is, and arguably also has pedagogical usefulness in making aspects of culture accessible in a similar way to simplifying grammar. We also need to think of children and their need for input and activities to be concrete and based on the here and now. So any model for developing intercultural competence with children needs to ensure that culture is represented in a way that is concrete, accessible and appealing, yet without being simplistic. Mm. And this leads into the next point which is the way that intercultural competence is taught. And this is often, as I just said, with an emphasis on what's foreign and different, the F topics, rather than <clears throat> developing children's skills and understanding of their own cultures and identities and the connections that they have with others. So we need to move beyond a binary approach and avoid simplistic comparisons and contrasts between cultures. And also, of course, it needs to relate to the child's real life experience at home and at school and use scaffolding or mediation to develop intercultural knowledge, skills, attitudes and awareness in age appropriate ways. And this leads to the next point about teachers' skills and capabilities. And I really, actually, in the literature, I can't bear it. There is a lot of criticism of primary teachers in the intercultural literature, that they have limited experience of other cultures, that they may have a narrow conception of culture as corresponding to national groups, that they may perceive their role as responsible for language and nothing else. They may also, and I think this is actually quite true, be under pressure to deliver the language syllabus and get children through tests and YLE exams. But an intercultural learning is not usually assessed. This is another point. And so it's often only included as an extra. However, I feel completely passionately that this is the wrong way to look at it. And that rather than seeing teachers' skills and capabilities as a deficit, a model for intercultural competence needs to build on the competencies and skills they already have. Primary and pre-primary teachers are experts in creating a caring and inclusive classroom environment. We're all increasingly familiar with technology and multimedia techniques that offer a way to bring culture into the classroom. Many of us have experience with CLIL or content-based teaching and engaging children with significant issues such as climate change. And plus, we all have training in communicative language teaching methodology which enables us teachers to facilitate intercultural learning through communication, discussion and reflection. And so this leads to the last point of issues and challenges <clears throat> that we, it's obvious, we need to reflect children's ages and stages of development in appropriate ways. And we need to provide suitable language support we also need to remember that as soon as children start school, intercultural learning is a daily reality. They're in a new context, new rules, new people, different behavior from home. And so rather than focusing on an us and them approach, 
focusing on differences and national borders, we need to adopt an approach which fosters individual children's multilingual and multicultural identities and develops intercultural skills and attitudes that relate to their everyday lives and experience at home and school and supports them in making connections with others. So what I'd like to move on to now is to um, share with you the model that I have developed for um, developing intercultural competence with children. And the first thing I would like to say is that it, this is actually a very bottom up rather than a top-down model. It's something that I originally developed several years ago. It came out of my own classroom practice and a practitioner's understanding of what children are capable of at different ages and stages. And over the years, and as a result of reading and applying increasing theoretical understanding of intercultural learning, um, it's evolved. And it is also a tried and tested model in the sense that I've always applied it to my own teaching and teacher education, and also when writing my published materials for teaching children. So the model has three phases, starting with the child and moving outwards from authentic children's cultures and the here and now, the play orientation, school and home experience of the very young child, to in the next stage, um, building on children's conceptual understanding and cognitive development to be able to engage in comparisons and contrasts between their own and other cultures. To, in the third phase, building on children's capacity for more abstract, formal thinking and adopting an inquiring, evaluative attitude and the foundations of critical cultural awareness. Across the model, we have transversal socio-cultural and citizenship themes, attitudes and values, things such as autonomy, social responsibility, respect for the environment, collaboration with others. And these are recycled and developed in ways that are appropriate to um, each phase. Um, I would also like to point out that the phases are cumulative and they are not discrete. So they're intended to be built on and extended cumulatively as children develop and mature. And borrowing on the work of um, Sims Bishop, Short and Holiday, each phase opens new windows onto children's intercultural awareness and understanding. Mirrors reflect the development of their own cultural identity and intercultural threads ensure that topics and themes are linked to children's personal experience of languages, cultures, and connections with others in the real world context of their lives. So let's have a look at samples of possible curriculum objectives in terms of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and awareness as part of each phase. So there you have phase one. I'm not going to read all this out, but you can skim it there. And what I would like to point out, though, that this phase is above all motivational, a focus on participation, a willingness to engage. Enjoyment plus this kind of developing awareness of the existence of other language systems that can be used for familiar activities such as games, stories, songs, etc. Moving on to phase two, children have the concepts and cognition to understand the idea of other cultures. They're also conceptually ready to relativize their own culture, make comparisons and contrasts to decenter and empathize. Empathize, of course, develops earlier, but they're also capable of thinking about it. And this also reinforces their own cultural identity. And moving on to stage three, 
where children are conceptually ready to consider the plurality of cultures. They have a greater capacity for analysis and understanding of their own culture and cultural identity, which provides the basis for interpretation, comparisons, and contrasts. And children's age and level of linguistic competence in this phase also allows more easily for interactions in an intercultural communicative context. So these samples show, give you a taste, <clears throat> if you like, of how we can progressively and systematically build a, a solid foundation for intercultural learning in preparation for secondary school and beyond. So how do we implement the model? And methodologically speaking, there are two main ways. <clears throat> One, through permeation, the term used by Byram. In other words, it's actually implicitly embedded in everything we do in the classroom. The way we relate to our learners, the way we ask them questions, the kinds of questions we ask, the way we scaffold and mediate learning. So that on the one side and on the other side, um, explicit instructions or activities. So let's have a look at some examples um, from each phase. So to start off with then, in phase one, Guy, to Guy Cook talks about the ubiquity of 4-4 four, four rhythm in nursery rhymes and verse for very young children in a wide range of world languages, including apparently, well, English, I know, but also Arabic, Mandarin, Chinese, Yoruba, and how the rhythm and beat provides a way into the language. Those three little rhymes there. You can do them with me at home. You know, we go round and round the garden like a teddy bear or hickory dickory dock. The mouse runs up the clock. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And Cook talks about how the child <clears throat> is led from verse as rhythm and social interaction, the emotional relationship with the adult they're doing it with, towards verse as grammar and lexis and meaning. And he speculates that one function of this widespread 4-4 rhythm may actually be to provide a path into language and arguably also into culture as well. We can also see this in traditional stories and their repetitive refrains, that children are led from rhythm to sound, to grammar, to meaning, to interaction and affinity with um, the cultures. So, for example, what big eyes you've got, all the better to see you with. Who's been eating my porridge? Or little pig, little pig, or little lamb, if you don't use pigs in your classroom, little pig, let me in. No, not by the hair on my chinny chin chin. I'll not let you in. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. So this focus on rhythm and sounds of language as a way into cultures raises the issue of the complex relationship between language and culture. I'm not going to go into this now, apart from to share with you this beautiful quote from the novel And the Mountains Echoed by Khaled Husseini. And this is um, the narrator of the novel talking about his father. He said, if culture was a house, then language was the key to the front door, to all the rooms inside. And of course, this relates to the kind of picture books that we use in phase one. And at first sight, some of these may not look as if they develop intercultural learning, but many of them have that repetitive or cumulative discourse pattern 
or use question and answer that draws children into using the language and feeling an affinity um, with its cultures. And these kinds of books um, can also be a springboard for making connections to children's own experience and cultures. For example, do you know the story of the hungry caterpillar in your language? Have you been to a zoo? What animals did you see? What do you want to be? Do you want to be a mermaid like Julian? Okay, so we can use picture books like this as a lead-in to intercultural learning. Another thing we can use um, at, in our phase one, which I absolutely love, and this is dances from other cultures. Dances, of course, are great for TPR, for counting, for actions, for developing physical coordination skills, and a sense of beat and rhythm, as well as making connections between children's languages and cultures. Here in these pictures, illustrated are salsa, merengue, and Bollywood. So what dances do children have in their families? Can they do them? Can they show them? Do their families do them? When? Shall we learn some of our different dances? So in this phase, um, we have windows opened onto the fact that children from diverse cultures enjoy similar activities to themselves in other languages. A mirror reflects children's developing competence, confidence, and positive self-esteem in participating in such activities. And an intercultural thread includes finding out about games classmates play or songs they sing and with who, in what languages, in their cultural context at home. Moving on in phase two, and children's ability to relativize and see their own culture and behaviors in relation to others and understanding other perspectives and points of view. So the kinds of picture books that we're going to use are going to be different. And here there are some that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. And I put references at the bottom there where you can find um, freely available materials based on those books. So you've got something else, bullying and exclusion, Gerald, the giraffe, self-esteem, lost and found, empathy and friendship, gender equality with Princess um, Smarty, Smarty Pants, um, Charlie and Lola, about sibling relationships and food fads and food in different cultures, and Cloudland, um, the value of family. So many, many picture books that we can, we can choose there. In fact, I always put up ones that I've actually used because I'm very confident about how those work. We can also, not just picture books, we can also use um, poetry uh, in this phase. And this poem, um, I'm not going to read it out, but you can skim it there by Shel Silverstein, shows that values are not black and white and impinges on intercultural learning too. So <clears throat> what we can do with the poem is we get children to identify the adjectives and their opposites in the poem. So good and bad, happy and sad, and so on. Um, we can then get them to make a list of more adjectives in pairs. And this may be some you know, dictionary work, you know, lazy, hardworking, kind, unkind, generous, mean, that kind of thing. And of course, what this leads into is <clears throat> children creating their own zebra poems. Okay. And um, this might be something like, Mm. Are you confident with shy moments or are you shy with confident moments or are you Moroccan with Spanish moments or are you Spanish with Moroccan moments? So what we have here is a creative activity within a, a structured framework and integrated with language practice and reflection that relates to intercultural learning. And one other thing that I'm going to mention for this phase is child-friendly jokes. Now, there's something immensely positively affirming about getting a joke in another language. And it also 
um, can make children reflect on their own language and also feel affinity with its cultures. So I won't um, inflict too much of this on you, but I'll just show you the kind of thing um, that goes down well with children. Okay, so why is Cinderella bad at football? Because her coach is a pumpkin. Or, this is an easy one, no? What kind of key opens a banana? A monkey. Or, how do bees go to school? By the school buzz. And one more, what do you call a dinosaur that sleeps all day? A dino snore. Oh dear, terrible, aren't they? I won't inflict any more of you, but children love these kinds of jokes. And what comes out of this is they also compare the kinds of jokes they tell. Do they work in each other's languages? No, most of the time they don't because it's a play on words that only works in their language. So we've got reflection on language as well as making those connections. So in this phase, <clears throat> we have windows opened onto children's understanding of other cultures, issues, feelings, and people, and how these relate to their own. We have a mirror that reflects and reinforces children's developing sense of their own personal and cultural identities through making direct comparisons and, contra and contrasts with their own lives. And intercultural threads by using effective scaffolding and questioning techniques children are helped to make connections and develop awareness of the multiple cultural realities um, that exist in their own classrooms. So moving on to phase three and into the um, ability to discover other perspectives and cultures in the wider world and question assumptions about your own culture. And in this, I want to use as an example, um, the engagement with real issues. And here is example based on the climate emergency and actually um, using material from the um, global goals, the word, world's largest lesson based on the UN sustainable development um, goals. And I've given you the link um, at the bottom down there. So what we would do <clears throat> is tell the children that we're going to watch a short video called um, a, climate, a Call to Climate Learning featuring children and young people from around the world talking about climate change issues. So we would get um, children, you can do it now in the chat box if you like, to predict the kind of issues that um, would get talked about. So we then have a look at those issues and children choose one issue and work in groups or breakout rooms, depending what our situation is, to share ideas about what they know about those issues and report back. And of course, we use this to introduce or remind them of relevant vocabulary, to find out which issues they're most interested in and concerned about, which ones they think affect their country or region, and also um, any other issues they can identify which aren't included. For example, there's nothing there about melting glaciers and rising sea levels. What we then do is um, introduce children to the young people in the, who feature in the video and get children to predict what they're going to talk about. And of course, there we're building on children's knowledge of the world. For example, I think Helena talks about deforestation. I think Dante talks about endangered animals. So they predict. The initial video task is to watch the video and match the people and issues, or quite simply to note the order in which they speak which they speak. And at that point, we would also, you know, 
elicit a personal response, which person and initiative do you admire the most? The second task for the video will be to choose one of these people, only one, and find out more detail about the problem and the positive action they've taken. Unfortunately, I can't show you the video now, but as part of the world's largest lesson resources, and you've got the link at the bottom of your screen, you're actively encouraged to use it in your lessons. And later, after today, when you have a moment, do go and have a look. And post-video, children report back on the issues and actions taken. This then, this then, this then leads in to a choice board with options for personalized, creative and collaborative work resulting in projects and direct action which derive from the positive actions that children will have heard about in the video. So making connections and discovering um, the lives of others. And at this phase, of course, we also are going to be using picture books as well. And the language level is obviously higher and the kinds of issues addressed may be more sophisticated. For example, Tango Makes Three, I love that book about the composition of families. The Day War Came, which I know we're going to be having a look at later in the, which is one of the most moving stories I know, and actually, you know, based on refugees and children's right to education. Clarice Bean, about the relationships between um, families. Um, Dear Diary, exploring different ways of perceiving things. And the true story of the three little pigs. Okay, wonderful for developing critical thinking, um, awareness of fake news and seeing other points of view. And again, I've put references at the bottom there where you can find um, freely available uh, classroom materials based on those. And so actually in this phase, a uh, window is opened on to discovering world cultures and global issues through investigative inquiry. A mirror reflects children's developing self-awareness of themselves as citizens in a global context. Their increasing competence in finding out about other cultures and interacting in an intercultural context. And in terms of our threads, by using scaffolding and probing questions and child-friendly reflection activities, children draw on their knowledge and skills to understand other cultures and to use their analytical and critical thinking skills to relativize them and compare them to, to their own. So thinking back to um, the kinds of um, issues and challenges that I mentioned earlier, um, when we work in this kind of way with children, it, first of all, provides a way of closing the gap between those positive beliefs about the value of intercultural learning and what actually happens in practice that I mentioned earlier. It also provides a framework for syllabus design. It allows Rather than it being haphazard and itsy bitsy, it allows for the planned progression of intercultural knowledge, skills, attitudes and awareness that is complementary to and integrated with the development of language competence. That culture is not represented, represented in a binary us and them way and connections are made to children's languages and cultures with their families at home and their peers at school. We have a balanced focus with a syllabus um, based on knowledge, skills, attitudes and awareness, which of course that comes from Byram, and plus these metaphors which underline the importance 
of one, children gaining new intercultural understanding, two, becoming increasingly aware of their own cultural identities, and three, establishing personal links and connections with their home and school environments. Working like this builds on teachers' existing skills and capable, the capabilities. And although much more needs to be done in teacher education, and I would certainly agree with that, we can, rather than seeing what teachers have as a deficit, to actually build on that and provide the support to do so in terms of syllabus objectives and learning outcomes, which as teachers, we're all very good at meeting. We know how to do that. And the last point there, that um, it's a model that is in tune with children's social, motion, emotional, psychological, cognitive, and conceptual development, and as well as, in, as promoting um, inclusion and belonging, it also lays the foundations for children to become responsible global citizens in the future. So that really brings me to the end. Um, I just have a final message, which I'd like to share with you. Okay, developing intercultural competence with children, if we do it effectively, will make the world a better place. So thank you very much.